life is not about a finite thing. It's not about I will achieve this thing and then I will be happy. It's more about the intrinsic motivation that you can get from doing a thing. And so by doing the thing, that's what can make you happy. Welcome back to the Sevo show. We are in March now. Things are going hectic with uh, the three companies. So for those of you who have been waiting for this episode or for another episode, uh, thanks for your patience. We do have more coming in. On today's show, we have Sian Brennan, a seasoned professional with a strong background in construction contracts and project management. He is currently the CEO of Quantum Contract Solutions, which is a Perth-based company assisting construction contractors in risk management, negotiation and contract documentation. Um, Brennan has held key positions in renowned organisations such as Turner and Townsend, Impex, Chevron, Ancura and Lightsight, where he has shown his expertise in construction contract and cost management at various project stages. Sian holds a Master's of Engineering Management from Curtin University and a Bachelor of Science, like me, with honours not like me, in construction economics and management from the Dublin Institute of Technology. He is fluent in French and has been endorsed by clients for his commercial expertise and professionalism. Brennan's career spans across Australia and the Middle East. He's got over 15,000 followers on LinkedIn. That's a huge B2B play there. Brennan, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. I am not fluent in French. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the perfect example of why you don't use AI to analyze someone. When I did the analyzation on here, um, I was like, okay, cool. Let's go and check through LinkedIn and see if it's accurate. Mm -hmm. Never did I find anywhere it said that you were actually fluent in French. So for those people that are trying to use AI for everything, always double check everything. Thank you for validating that. Now, I'm going to skip the other question. Discuss a project where your fluency in French was instrumental. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Brendan, thanks for being here. Now, um, we had a chat before um, off mic about uh, a whole bunch of things already. Sure. And uh, we'll definitely dive into them. But uh, for everybody at home, the younger audience specifically, mm -hmm. give me three words. In three words, what do you do? I am an um, entrepreneur. Yeah. A leader. Mm -hmm. And I'm a writer. Nice. And what's your what's your uh, what's your thing that you write about? Construction. Nice. Construction. So that's an interesting question because I have kind of exited my own business. Mm -hmm. So I'm no longer in the day-to-day -day ops, um, and I sit on our owners team. So does the business runs by itself, and so that happened reasonably recently. So last last three months and. I thought, you know, that's kind of the game of entrepreneurship where you, you know, you start off by yourself and then you hire someone to do the stuff you don't want to do or the, or the other way to say it is hire people so you can focus on high revenue generating activities and then you grow from there and then you hire key positions and then you hire someone to run the company and then you have a leadership team in place and then you eventually kind of exit your own business or you go for a proper exit. And so... That was always the goal, to play that game. And uh, the goal for this year is to write a book on how to run construction businesses properly. Because we, in our business, we have all, all of that data and we can see how it goes wrong. And so for the last three months, I've been a writer, which I found really hard. Uh, but it's a kind of an identity shift in that I have really struggled in this three months. I thought it would be great. And uh, it turns out I really miss the day-to-day -day ops, the kind of pandemonium. And it's hard to find that new place for me where I can operate in my, in my best capacity. So that's kind of my last few months has been that. And it's trying to be a writer um, and spending time, which is a different mode. Like I found that I can't write in my office at all. My office is a place, is my watering hole for work and just smashing stuff out can't seem to write so i've been going to cafes to do all my writing and just trying to get into that mindset of operating at a different pace in a different way more creatively which i found quite difficult amazing amazing so let's go back to the the exit let's talk about that for a second for the younger audience an exit is where you're pretty much 
you don't have to do anything with the business. It runs itself because you've replaced yourself completely. And a proper exit, explain to the audience what a proper exit is. Okay, well, there's, diff there's, diff there's all different kinds of proper exits, right? Mm -hmm. So you can have a trade sale. So you, you sell your business to a third party completely, entirely. It's low, that's f that whole thing is fraught with loads of different ways that that can be done. You can uh, sell the business to employees. Uh, a lot of people do as well. Um, a combination of those things can happen as well. You can sell a portion of your business and retain some, some equity. And then there's obviously exiting your own business and so it just sits on your own personal balance sheet as an asset, and someone else is running it, someone else is, is growing it. So they're the different kind of exits in, in my mind. Have you experienced all of them, or just that one specifically, where it's asset? Yeah, no, I've experienced, I've had uh, two acquisitions. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one um, was, I would say, and I'm not allowed to say, names mm -hmm. confidentiality but a very well known entrepreneur in the in the online business space uh, i think most people will, will know who i'm talking about and so i went through an acquisition process with those guys and the thing is um and a, a mentor of mine is telling me about is people who acquire companies have done this hundreds of times and you may only do it once in your in a, in a lifetime and it, it is it opened my mind to all of these different games that are being played, um, all the different risks that can happen. Um, so the first one was someone just wanted to buy a, a large chunk of the business. And then there was seller financing, which means that they don't actually give you any money. You, they will, of the profits that they get from, this, from the acquisition, they will repay you until they hit that number. So you kind of finance it yourself, that's one, one, one type of way that it can happen. So that was the first one, going through all of those issues in there and the due diligence and people going through your accounts and questioning stuff. Um, and all of that like, was, was eye-opening for sure. Um, and froth with dangers. Um, but that was, that was actually okay. And we, uh, I decided, or both of us decided not to go ahead in the end, um, which, was, which was fine, a lot, lot of money spent on, on both sides, but ultimately it wasn't a good for a good outcome for both parties. The second one was more of a venture capital company. So this is again, a, these guys are totally. This is their game. They play this game, and so typically the game that they play is they want to buy small, medium-sized companies that are pr very very profitable, have a lot of cash flow, and they're trading at three or four times a multiple. So a multiple is like your your profit, your EBITDA and multiply it by three or four, and that's how they value the, the, the company. And so they, what they generally try and do is these VC companies is they will buy four or five of these companies, put them into one company, and then that company, given that now it's, it's, it's a much higher profit, should be trading at seven or eight times multiple. So they'll either sell that on, or they might list it onto the stock exchange. So they merge and then they, shoot, they, they flip. They flip it, right? And so, one way to look at this and, uh, is that entrepreneurs are in the business or in the game of value creation. These guys are in the business of value extraction. How can we get businesses, put them together and extract as much value as possible, which is ultimately the reason I didn't go ahead is not a game I wanted to be part of realistically. And so these guys offered me a large amount of money up front, like half, and then the other half was equity in this new business that they had, this, this company that they were going to buy businesses, mm. and then they were going to list it on the stock market. And so it sounded good. The, the total value uh, looked like it was going to be a good deal. But then when I dug into that company that I was now going to be a 47% owner of, it had $1 million sitting in the bank. It had no, and that was it. It had no revenue whatsoever. Um, and so my dividend of the 47% is, would be nothing. Um, and so it was all promises of what they were going to do. So that the portion of the business that they valued very, very highly actually wasn't worth very much. And so the risk I would have had was I would sure I would have gotten a bit of money up front, but the other part of it, I would have relinquished control of my own business. They wanted to get rid of our, uh, our leader of the organization and replace him with a different CEO. You and didn't want to dog him, did you? No, I didn't. No, no I didn't. That's good of you. And um, 
And the risk of that other thing not happening and having no control over this other company that they were going to acquire and then list them to the stock market, just the whole thing was just too risky to me. Wow. Um, but it was going through that process twice where I, I realized, oh, there's different ways to exist. Uh, you're, you don't have to, I mean, really, if you sell your business, you all of a sudden you lose cash flow, um, which is one thing. You get money, sure. You lose half because you get paid in one tax year. So you're going to lose a lot of it in, in tax, a lot of it in tax. And then you probably pay off some big things in your life, which is cool. But then you've got this money left over. And what are you going to do? Like if you're an entrepreneur like me, you're probably going to buy a business. But I already had a really good business. And so that You're was... You're taking steps back. It's almost taking steps yeah. back. It was almost like a, an ego play where I was like, I just wanted to say I sold my business so I could be a real entrepreneur that has exited that way. Which is kind of like, oh, that's, that's why... Like, oh, I thought that was the next level of the yeah. game to do that. Okay, so, you, so that took a lot of, you know debating with myself and and figuring out what I really wanted to do and all of that sort of stuff to understand that I didn't want to do that. Did you get approached or did you approach these two the opportunities? The first one I approached yeah. because there was kind of a, a, an application process online um, and then they, they got on the call with them and they're like, hey, if you do X, Y, and Z and you hit these numbers, we'll invest. So I did the X, Y, and Z, hit those numbers and they're like, right, let's do it. How long did that take? For me to hit the numbers? Yeah. Probably a year. Wow. Probably. Are you are you goal driven like that? Is that one of your big strengths? Mm. Would you say? Yes, for sure. How do you how do you build that habit? It's a really good question. Um so I mean just the book Atomic Habits, basically. Ah, uh, James. I love that book. <laughs> just like Love that book. So there's so it's you've 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 got a You've got a goal, whatever the goal that you ha you have. Okay, it is what it is. What it is it doesn't matter. No, no one cares, right? You don't have to have a reason for your goal. Your goal is your goal. It doesn't matter what you want, right? You want, you want a car, whatever. It doesn't matter. But what can you do every day that's super easy? Every single day. If I, I know that if I do this little thing every day, I will definitely get that. And and that and uh, to make it as simple as possible, in the business, everything. It's like okay. We need. We are outbound, so we do cold calling, right, and cold DMing, <sighs> right. And that's so, the, that's <laughs> so if we know if we make X amount of calls, we're going to get X amount of sales. Mm. And so, if our goal is to increase revenue, we go well. How many sales do we need, right? What does that mean to the day-to-day -day thing? All right. What does that mean for each sales rep? How many calls do they mean to make? How many DMs do they need to do? Yeah, the maths. And, and then we have the daily targets. And then we go well. All we have to do is hit those daily targets every day, and then the goal will come on its own. That's pretty much every sales book I've ever read. Literally, that that is the f summary of it. That's it. That's the summary of sales. It's not that hard. No. No. And with, and with volume as well, volume is, in my view, volume yeah. is almost always the answer. It it's is volume, skill, and time. With volume comes skill. Mm. Through time. Uh, yeah. 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 And that's, I mean, for me, my final hurdle is sales. Yeah. I hate sales. I'm good at sales. I mm. hate sales. Mm. I hate asking. Because mm. I don't like asking. Yeah. And I... I, I and that was like a like a big thing when I was a kid. Mm. Um, I'd always ask my stepdad if I can go on the computer, and he'd be like, "Why? Well, what's what are you doing?" And he's just been sitting on the couch the whole time. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's like a trauma thing. Maybe, maybe. But I've overcome it, right? Mm -hmm. But leading up to my journey, I've got good products, good um, success stories. Um, networking is good. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the marketing is really good. Mm -hmm. It's just the sales. Yep. I'm still yet to crack it for this new venture that I'm in. So I don't know how much research you've done on me. Mm -hmm. Just a quick backstory. Math, high school maths teacher. Yes. Love photography, hence the name Sev's Picks. Mm -hmm. Somehow got into weddings, which I never thought I would ever do. Loved it. Wanted to prove a point to myself and someone else. And... At the same time, I love making content. Mm -hmm. Went viral on TikTok. 
I saw. said to people that I do weddings on there, got two bookings, doubled down on that because it worked. Anytime mm -hmm. something works, I just double down. Yep. I'm like, sick, it works. Isn't it funny how some, some, sometimes people don't do that? So that instead of doing more, they change. I don't know why to do that. Yeah. But then I went through this kind of dance of... I have to uh, the, the client the couples are about to ask me how much it's going to cost. Mm. So I read some books, did some mentoring, got a mentor who went to high school with. His name's Kieran, absolute legend. He forex my business all because of a sales pitch mm -hmm. sort sort of kind of one one call sales pitch, and it works every time. It's mm -hmm. crazy. Um, and yeah, I got through that. But then people start asking me, how did you get so many clients? Because mm. I booked out for two years, and I said. TikTok. Now everybody's asking me how they can do that as well. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? Now I'm a marketer or a, I'm, a, I'm an advisor, more so an advisor for marketing because I did it really well myself. Mm -hmm. I hate the word consulting because it's overused, but I am technically that too. But now I'm in this bigger game where the tickets are a lot higher than a five or $10,000 wedding. There's mm -hmm. an extra zero on top of that. And I've mastered that as well. Like I've closed $100,000 deals, which is sounds surreal because four years ago now times time's gone fast but four years ago minus two because of that flu that happened it's so surreal <clears throat> being able to make something in one month that i spent four years studying at university to make in a year mm. right but that's that's where i'm that's where i'm heading to now um to segue back to you um my ultimate mantra my ultimate journey goal is to educate people that if they study something at university and they work for someone else but they're not quite fulfilled, they're not quite happy with their lifestyle, they want, I don't know, whatever, like all this bigger stuff, don't go into debt, get into a bigger business, get into a bigger play, get into a bigger game to be able to successfully do that without locking yourself into debt for 30 years, right? Mm -hmm. So you've, would you say you've escaped the rat race? if your basic costs of living are covered by your dividends, whether they're in your um, your business assets or maybe even your shares portfolio? Yes. How does that feel? How does that feel knowing you can literally start from zero and have that checkpoint no matter what? So it's a really good question. and I, I don't think you're going to like my answer. I'm ready for it. It's, my answer is I've already achieved the stuff that I said would make me happy. How old are you? 40 next month. 40 next month. Mm. So, so sold by 40, like achieved everything. Not what was not, not see, it's not achieved everything. So when like, you know, when, when I first, you know, when I, was, when I was in a job, it was like, if I can just get to this level, then I'll be happy. And I got to that level. And then I was like, I don't want to do the job thing. Anyway, I'll talk about consultants in a sec. We can mm. go back to that. Mm. Because uh, I was a consultant. And um, then I was like, okay, if I can just get a business that pays, so like just, just covers our expenses, great. That, like that would be it. Because then I'm just, then I'm, I can do whatever I want and I'm happy. Did that. And so it's, it's more of, I, I know, like our friend talks about the, or Simon Sinek talks about infinite games. It's, it's, life is not about a finite thing. It's not about I will ch achieve this thing and then I will be happy. It's more about the intrinsic motivation that you can get from doing a thing. And so by doing the thing, that's what can make you happy. Um, and so you might have to do like a, I, I gave a, a, a training today to my team on, on feedback and motivation. And, and we talk about intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. So they're, they're both really powerful. So extrinsic motivator are like goals and things and money and stuff that I will have to, to do a thing. And so they are, they're still powerful motivators. Of course they are. But intrinsic motivation is way more powerful. And that's kind of the goal now. So what can I be doing every day for the rest of my life that I'm going to be really happy doing that thing? And so the analogy I gave to the team today was like learning a piano. When you first start off learning a piano, you're, you're horrible. I don't, I don't play the piano, right? <laughs> uh, in case your AI went down there, master piano player, right? So um, you, you're horrible, right? And you're no good at it. And so you need extrinsic motivation 
right by you know people saying hey you did a great job working on that you did like whatever you, you're getting there whatever your extrinsic motivated goals i'm going to get to this blah 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 to get to the point of that skill that now you can play the piano lovely and you can play songs and now, now you just want to play the piano because it's beautiful and i, I love playing the piano because i have this skill so I used to be, and you talk about goals, I used to be so goal-oriented, goal I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and now I've changed to be like, well, no, I want to do stuff that makes me fulfilled and happy every day. Um, and it's take, but uh, the, the hard thing about this is it's sometimes I feel that you have to have achieved your goals to realize that, and it's very hard to take someone's word on that. It's easy for you to say because you've achieved X, Y, and Z, and you yeah. have a business that is X, Y, and Z, to be able to say that, oh, I just... I like working. I like running businesses. I can relate. I think, like, for me, my current goal is financial freedom. But I know that as soon as I get there, it'll be, I like doing what I do anyway. Yeah. I already like what I do anyway. Yeah. It's just this thing that's hanging over me that wants me to get to that checkpoint as, like, a safety sort of thing. Mm. Evidence. It, uh, not really evidence. I don't really care about materialistic shit. No, I mean evidence as in like when you're thinking like I've done that, I achieved that thing. Yeah, but but also I want to be able to flip a switch at any point because I've changed my career like five times mm -hmm. within three or four years and that's just who I am. But I hated starting again thinking about the money I have to make to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. If I could just cover that... Then I can go be a barista in Fremantle for, for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Start a shop, see what happens with it, market the shit out of it on TikTok, mm -hmm. blow it up to something big. Someone else comes along and wants to buy it. I'll be like, nah, we're all right. Mm -hmm. You know, yep. just that freedom. But also that freedom of going, hey, if there's another pandemic, we're okay. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that sort of stuff. Like I come from Russia. We come from nothing. And we have bartering. That's all we do. It's all we have. Mm -hmm. We get paid once every three to six months, and we like have to. We have our own backyards with you know veggie patch and and cows and chickens and stuff. So the food's right, and the house we had has been passed down from generation to generation. We all live in the same sort of shell within the within the system. We go to school. We get a get a, a degree or something. There's still universities there, but the pay is terrible unless you escape, which we have. Mm -hmm. But just having a look at that and proving to myself, I guess, is just like, okay, can I grab that financial freedom and then go anywhere in the world, travel wherever. Obviously, I'll still I, – I want to work. I have, I have three days off mm -hmm. and I want to go back and do stuff, something. Oh, yeah. I want to get an email and go, what problem do you have mm -hmm. that we need to solve? Mm -hmm. What problem do I have and how do I solve it as quickly as possible? So there's, there's funny parts that. on this particular thing, right? Mm. Because um, – and this was – at a level in your business, you can go wrong with this particular thing, right? Because, um, so for example, last few months, I haven't been involved in the business at all. And everything in, in me wanted to just go in there, mess it up a little bit, just so I could fix it. Okay. Which is a lot of entrepreneurs go through this stage of when they're bringing in new people into the business, people to run the business, they undermine them, they can't let them run the business, and the best thing for you to do is to stay out, which is really hard for an entrepreneur like, like me and you, who likes the day-to-day, -day, likes working, and so that skill of, you know, what, one thing I used to do all the time, which would drive my team crazy, was I'm just full of ideas. Mm. We should do this, we should do this, we should do it this way, we should do it this way, and meanwhile, they're trying to execute on the original plan, and I'm there changing things left, right, and center. I want to do this, and I want to do this. And that's a different skill that you have to learn at a level in entrepreneurship to go, no, yeah. no, I just that needs to do more of what it's currently doing and accelerate, and I need to make sure that when I have those entrepreneurial thoughts, I do them in the right form that's not going to mess these guys up here. Yeah. See, going back to the whole exit strategy thing, my exit strategy for my businesses, my companies is – selling a product that I'm building. Mm -hmm. it's, it's AI based idea script generation and it's coded, prompt engineered in a way that is 
subjectively, I'm going to be biased, but it's better than what I've seen out there because mm-hmm. a lot of them have come up and they've used. You can tell they use ChatGPT code just to build this thing, just just to get it out there and make a quick buck. Yep. I've been working on this for a while, right? Now I'm not plugging my own stuff on my own channel, but the exit strategy is to be able to sell it to someone fully. You know, maybe there's a five percent keep in there just in case they become the next. It becomes mm-hmm. the next best thing, and then. But I don't. I don't need that much money. Mm-hmm. Nobody needs that much money. I need a specific amount that gets me seven to ten grand dividends every month for the rest of my life. But what are you going to do, Dan? Great question. I have my personal brand. My mm-hmm. personal brand, I can never sell because it's me. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, I may as well work on the corner, right? So I want to build my personal brand to a philanthropic state where I'm helping kids going out to... Um, schools and talking and not charging much. I want everyone to be able to afford it. I'll fork out my own ticket to get to the remote place that the kids need to hear something from. Mm -hmm. And I'm not preaching. I'm talking from experience, from observation, Mm -hmm. answering the questions that they want answered that their teachers can't answer because their teachers have been institutionalised since high school. Mm -hmm. High school, uni, work. They've never left the school system. Mm -hmm. What do they know? Now, there are some amazing teachers out there, but there's, only, there's, a, there's far too many that are just career teachers. They, yep. don't, they don't have much mm-hmm. value outside of the curriculum that they've been taught, mm-hmm. right? I've always thought that when I was a teacher and I thought, how do I disrupt that? I, couldn't, I could never disrupt that within the school system mm-hmm. because I'm working for the school system mm-hmm. and whatever I come up with becomes their IP. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I left done now i'm here i make this exit strategy and then i put that money into my shares portfolio which the shares be able to pay the i guess the the salaries of the people close that were working working with me Mm -hmm. producers editors videography all of that stuff I'm not consulting or anything. I'm not working for anyone else. I'm not even caring about any collaborations that come in Mm -hmm. unless it's Visa or Emirates Mm -hmm. uh, or someone like that that can cut the costs of flights to a country that needs to hear my message Mm -hmm. for all of my crew. That's Mm -hmm. a great collaboration, you Mm -hmm. know, offset the cost sort of stuff. But the philanthropic goal is to build my personal brand to the point where like kids walk down the street already. They want to take a photo with me. Mm. Every, like we walk down the street, I guarantee you three or four people will stop. That's crazy to me. That's crazy. Crazy. But I want them to have the, uh, the reason why they stop, not because I'm popular on TikTok. Mm-hmm. It's because they saw a video that changed their life. And mm-hmm. in 10 years from now, those same people recognize me because I wouldn't have aged a day, right? Of course. And they were like, Sev, that video you made 10 years ago got me onto a path that just got me focused. That podcast that you did with Sian, Mate, that was life-changing. Money can't buy that experience. No. It can't. It can, and it, it's but, only... But, but the money, f- well, this is interesting thought about money. M- money gives you options. Mm. That's, that's it. You're like, you know, if a bigger box to live in, all, that, all of that sort of stuff. But, you know, I'm not that anti-money. Like, I'm, I'm very pro-money in that, you know, I do my philanthropic, I can't even say the word, in, in, a, in a different way, right? So, so right now, we, we just donate money, a percentage of our, our, um, uh, the revenue from the company. The goal is to division for, um, f- for my batch of companies, federation of companies, is to have one of them be a foundation and so all the companies that sit underneath that banner, all of them are obliged or have to donate 5% of, of net profit into the foundation. And the thing that I've not been particularly happy with, so we, we, right now we're not in a position to do that. Uh, and so we've just been donating d- directly to Ronald McDonald House, uh, B1, G1. If you don't use B1, it's, it's great. Like, so every time someone does a piece of work for us, we, don't, we, we buy something. So everything we do is related to something. So that, that's very important to me. But I like the idea of having a foundation that I can control h- what I put the money into mm. and mm. who I put the money into and yeah. where it goes. So even, even Ronald McDonald House, which I love because it's for kids and... Um, 
is is the best I can do now. But in the future, it'd be nice to. And uh, we, when I was back in Ireland, we used to push this huge paper. We used to make this paper mache duck, mm. massive like massive thing, and every year we would push it from Dublin to Limerick, which was, you know, a three days of, of just pushing it on the motorway. Everything's just, uh, we'd have a van running behind it and pushing and we'd, we'd r rotate people and we'd push the whole thing. And every time we went through, we would uh, collect money, but then we would buy an incubator for a hospital. And then you, you bought that one thing. I like the idea of going to a hospital or, or something or whatever it is and go, well, here's the project for this time. We're gonna buy this incubator what that they need and we're going to do tangible. that thing. it's tangible it's tangible yeah exactly so that's pretty much what i want to do mm. but i'm the charity yep i'm the one that's funding myself mm -hmm. to actually deliver the machine to the person mm -hmm. but also teach them how to use it yeah yeah but also using it with them yep in my own spare time mm -hmm. and seeing their eyes open wide going thank you so much we needed this so badly yeah you know like you talk about mr beast mm. He's got that philanthropic channel, channel mm -hmm. right? Similar stuff. Mm. For me, it's not about documenting everything and making a video of, out of it. You know, restoring the, the hearing and the, and the sight for people, for a thousand people, amazing. Mm. Crazy, crazy guy. And he's, what, only 25, 26? Crazy, mm. right? I want that opportunity for me in Australia to be, able to, to be able to help the people in need but more importantly the kids help them realize a problem that they will eventually have mm. but prevent it from happening which is if i put it down into a couple of words it's help them with their self-awareness through expanding and, and building on their self-esteem those two mixed together is like all-time undefeatable mm -hmm. if, you, if your self-awareness and your self-esteem are like top you're sorted mm. And then from there, it's learning how to pivot from when you don't want to do anything anymore, when you don't want to do something specific anymore. Uh, financial literacy, so understanding money and how to use it. Mm -hmm. And also, yeah, the self-awareness thing. Yeah, I, I, That's all I want to do. There's, I'd be open to, um, if, you know, I'm not telling you how to go about it, but obviously with a, with a big brand on, on Twitter, um, I was on Twitter on um, TikTok. TikTok. Yeah. Um, there's different ways to achieve your goal, um, and you know w one of the the key things for your businesses now to consider is why would they listen to you? And so, if you can achieve stuff in your current businesses, um, I think the fact that you've achieved this the stuff and you've achieved what they want to do, and now you're talking to them that would make a big difference to these people. It's authority. It's a th yeah. authority. Yeah. And then also, there's just different ways to go to go about it. I mean, I've always, every time, like my daughters go to school, I mean, they're young now, but I always think like, they don't teach the kids stuff that they need. Like obviously it's like maths and stuff, oh sure, okay. But they don't teach stuff that they need now in the new age. Um, the stuff that you talked about, the, the, the financial literacy thing, without doubt. Like when, when kids are 17, 16, 17, 18, without doubt, there needs to be a course or there needs to be a module or exams on how to manage your, just the, not, even, not even financial literacy, not even at the level of how to make money work for you and, and business stuff, not even there. One level down of how to manage your own personal finances. Like, yeah. don't, don't, like, don't buy a car with debt. You know, just, just like, and here's yeah. why, here's yeah. why, and let me show you an example of why not. I uh, know right? I've got stories myself, you know, making those decisions early on. Same, same. And yeah. like, I don't have a mortgage because mm. I refuse to buy a house right now because mm. it'll put me in debt. Mm -hmm. The debt becomes a somewhat of a shackle. They say, oh yeah, you know, the house is equity and blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, going back to high school, the one regret I had was buying a twenty-five thousand dollar car at nineteen. Mm -hmm. My mum said, "Live your best life," but what she should have done is no, buy this four thousand dollar car and be no no debt in your twenties. Mm -hmm. I was in debt in my twenties for a stupid car that I don't care about anymore. Mm -hmm. Sold it years ago. No one explains the impact on no. on your on your lifestyle. There's no practical explanation mm -hmm. because the educators in the system 
they are probably all do the, that. They're all the same. They probably do that, right? <laughs> yeah. They probably have. There's a there's a phrase called uh, the what is it? I talk about this every single day. It's off the uh, tip of my tongue. Uh, normalization of deviant behavior. Yes, that's great. That's great. And the the, the buying. I mean, like I, I'm totally like bought into what you're saying. Mm. Ha- I currently have have absolutely no debt. Um, stuff changes over time. Yeah. When you have family and kids and you want a homestead and all of that sort of stuff. Me right now, I want kids. Yeah. And, and my wife wants a house to be safe in. Yeah. And I totally get it. Yeah. And so there is there's an element of flexibility, but there's an element of you got to be in control and, and handling what you're you're taking on. Um, debt, obviously, there's good debt, there's bad debt. We could talk all, all, all day on that. Um, but for me, debt is like a shackle. Um, if you have no debt, your stuff can go wrong, but they can't go that badly wrong. Yeah, because the risk isn't like, what's the worst that can happen? Oh, you can't, oh, you can't make payments. Payments for what? Mm. There's no payments to make. We're yeah. sweet. And that's why I tell kids, like, be good to your parents, have a good relationship with them. Obviously, I tell the parents, let your kids flourish mm-hmm. without, you know, molding them into what you want. Mm-hmm. But if that relationship can sus- be sustained into their 20s, they save so much money on rent. They have a nice home-cooked meal. They have all these things that they don't have to worry about. Mm-hmm. They should still learn mm-hmm. how to do that for themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, leave the nest eventually. Mm-hmm. But don't be in a rush just because your mates moved out at 18. I felt slightly different. Like, this a bit, I, I, I totally agree with you. Yeah. But... By the way, I moved out at 18. Yeah, yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> well, it depends. I went to boarding school, so you could say I moved <laughs> out at twelve, but um, or eleven. But there's an element there that you you, you got it like the the whole guy playing video games in his mum's basement, right? That's not what we mean. No, no, not at all. If if you're if you're living at home, saving money, and trying to do something, I'll buy into that all day. Stay in my house as long as as long as you need to. But if you're just if you're just doing it and you're not getting ahead by this scenario, well then I'm I'm kind of against it because you're not learning, and you probably need to get burnt and go out and let it let it bad happen like buy the stupid car. Yeah, what's your fe- plan? Feel feel the pain for yeah. a while, and then be like, uh, for me, like growing up, I always just wanted to be independent and I wanted to get out from under my parents and I wanted to not be told what to do, and so that's that was my. Reasoning for I just want to do what I want. I'll, I'll go get a job, and my, my job was to fund my fun times. That's all I wanted to do, um, and that was my motivation to get out. But if you're trying to build for something, like I think you totally agree, stay at home for as long as you can, build up uh, as much cash as you can, start a business. Um, if you can get into the property game and you understand that property game, um, at least now you're you've done it with a bit of cash behind you, rather than you know being debted up to the hilt. And that's exactly the matrix that I want to build as my curriculum from mm-hmm. my personal brand. Because mm-hmm. I thought, okay, I'm a personal brand. I'm doing collaborations, advertising, audio companies, Red Rooster, you know. And I've evolved into what do I really want? What do I use that I am happy to promote? Mm-hmm. And then leverage that collaboration anyway, mm-hmm. you know. And I've done that. Mm-hmm. You know, I've leveraged almost all my costs based off of the brands that I, that I use, you know. And now I want to be able to share my story, but then also tell those kids everything you just said, you know, what is your plan? Mm. My sister, she's, a, she's finished a degree last year in fi- uh, um, fashion design in Melbourne. Mm-hmm. She's still in Melbourne. She only just got a job in retail again. She was working in retail before. She's got a plan, sort of. And, you know, I'm trying to give her some hints and push her a little bit. I just like network. What is your dream sort of like end goal, but then reverse engineer it and pick those habits. So we're going back to the habits Mm -hmm. thing. But my brand, I want to be able to fund my brand from my experiences, from all these collaborations, which I've done, from these businesses I'm building, which I'm doing. But eventually the brand is, that is it. And people want to, want to go what is Sev doing next who is he going to help next mm-hmm. there's a guy called Simon Squibb he's from the UK and he's 
done very similar stuff in terms of he sold his company mm -hmm. for millions of dollars and he's always on the case of everybody have you ever want to start a business that's his, that's his like main question mm -hmm. he wants to unlock everybody's capability of wanting to start their own business because mm -hmm. with your own business you have full control mm -hmm. you have elements like <laughs> the pandemic sure you have elements of clients not wanting to buy your stuff but that's where you figure it out mm -hmm. when you work for someone else you're vulnerable and even even if you have a shares portfolio you're still technically vulnerable but with your own business you have full control it's scary and most people don't want to go down that path because it's not the safe path and that's where the school system fails people and i want to come in and tell them hey everything you just said and more in whatever uh scenario we're in because i talk about resilience all the time bullying you know all those things that they're currently going through mm -hmm. but the big topic i want to talk about is prevention of a problem that they don't know yet mm -hmm. and that calls in the US because we pretended that we, we had it we were located in the US right just to all of those things just to get off the ground just to, to go like all of that stuff it's hard and like a, a, a job like if you if you make if you like uh, let's just uh, if you make like if you just get a million dollar business right you're making a million dollars in profit Right? Like, so, uh, let's just say, no, not even a profit. You're making a million dollars in revenue, right? No, no mean feat, right? It's not, it's not like most people will be happy you're making a million dollars in revenue. And so let's just say you have a margin. Let's say you've good, you a good margin, right? You've got a margin of, of 30%. So you've got 300 grand mm. into your pocket. Like, you can get a 300 grand job in Perth. Not particularly hard. Mm. You can go up north. You could whatever, and so lifestyle-wise, there there are different ways to do it. The only thing is, you probably won't grow any more than that. Uh, and if the the main thing I would focus on is if you're not happy in your job, and you're you've got golden handcuffs on, you're going in every day, and you're getting paid. That's that's a that's a problem I'm seeing. There's lots of people who are not getting paid enough. Perth's kind of different in that there's a lot of people getting paid bloody well. And are really unhappy because every, you know things are expensive, but they're getting paid well. They can't leave the job because they're getting so paid so well, and that's a spin people get into as well. Where how do I leave this two hundred and fifty grand a year job to start a business there? Where it might take me a couple of years, it might take me five years to get back to the same um, amount of you money in my pocket. You mentioned golden handcuffs. Why are they handcuffed in the first place? Yeah, they're spending too much, yeah. basically, yeah. Sorry for the interruption, but this show would not be possible without the help of Bright Tank Brewery. They are the major sponsor of the Sevo Show. Huge shout-outs to them. Check them out. Great beers, great people, great everything. And, uh, well, let's get back to the episode. Well, they're spending too much, but they're in debt too much because they're not spending they, – they, they can't – they're not spending enough to quickly. True, they're true. not getting enough. They're not getting paid enough. Mm -hmm. That's the actual. That's what I have observed. They're, they're getting into debt. They're they're living beyond their means. Oh, that's that's true. I, that's I completely that's agree what with I that. see golden handcuffs as. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And that is one of the problems that I want to help educate mm -hmm. the kids mm -hmm. for. Yeah. If you're working a nine to five, that's great. And if you're happy with that, that's great. 
But know this, and this is where the pivot element comes in. This is where my pivot education is. Do not live without beyond your means because there is a high chance that 5, 10, 15 years down the line of your 9 to 5 career that you love, you might just wake up one day and go, I hate this. That was me. But if you're in debt, too bad. Mm. So that's where the financial literacy comes in. Mm-hmm. If you want to pivot, you must. You can only pivot these days if you're financially literate and you set yourself up to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. They want to start their own business today, but they can't because their dream is shattered because of the golden handcuffs. Yep. So what do you do? You have to know from the beginning that investing into the right index funds, and there's evidence that there's some index funds that have been around for decades mm-hmm. that are like far greater than having a bank account with savings. I, I'm going to challenge you on this one. Okay. Is that okay? Okay. So my view on, I, I've got index funds. Mm-hmm. My, and depends on how, how old you are as well. And yes, I get, I get the old adage, if you invest this and it compounds over 20 or 30 years, mm-hmm. it'll, it'll amount to a large amount of money. So also a lot of inflation that happens in, people never talk about how much inflation happens during that period. So people say you invest $500 or $1,000 in, in, you know, in 30 years time, you have a million dollars. What's a million dollars worth to you then? It's probably only worth, what, what, like, what is it gonna be worth? Like, a, uh, who knows, right? So Correct. people never bring that into the equation. Also, that's a great strategy if you have a lot of money, mm. right? For sure. Is that the best strategy to getting a lot of money? In my view, it's not. You can there's there's ways to get more money. If you want to make a lot of money, right? You can you can play that game. You're playing that game for thirty or forty years without a doubt. And yes, the the, the result is almost guaranteed. Yeah. I get it. But you're still playing that game for for that period of time. Whereas you could have started a business. You could have learned all of those skills. You could have failed at a business four or five times, and eventually learned all the skills, got it right, and then grown that business, and it'll be far more valuable than the index fund, sell, sell the business, and then you can put the money in, into a passive fund. And, you're, and you've achieved a 30, 30 under 30 award. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly where I was getting to. Mm-hmm. So your challenge was part two of my message. When I heard this mentor say this, which is pretty much exactly what you said, mm-hmm. he said, how do you make $36 million in 24 months? Mm-hmm. The speed, just the time. And I said, I don't know, you're the VC. You tell me, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm listening. It's about finding those opportunities and looking deep into problem solving or solving problems that are worth a lot of money. Mm -hmm. There's gaps everywhere. That's how you do it. Yep. And I thought, okay. And this was at the time where I just started my business. I just left my full-time teaching job. Mm -hmm. And I thought, "I'm, I'm on the... I'm on the projection of making 100, 150K a year with this wedding photography Mm -hmm. job. And I'm only working 30 to 60 days a year. Mm -hmm. And I can delegate half of that to an editor. Mm -hmm. 30 days a year. I did that. The next year, my financial advisor, who's a close friend of mine, Rakesh, he said, okay, your next goal is to make 300,000. I'm like, what are you you crazy? Mm -hmm. Like 2021? Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. All right, let's give it a go. Did it. Almost made half a million in 2021. And I'm like, how is that possible? But it's because I created those habits. But that money I didn't invest in correctly at the time into the index. I didn't follow the plan properly because I wanted to get out of the country because everyone was locked in for so long. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to help my wife get out of her shitty job. So I helped her escape, right? But going back to your point of your challenge... That's exactly what I'm still trying to achieve right now. But And there's different ways, again, to, to consider, right? So, question for you, mm-hmm. right? You've got 100, 200 grand to invest, mm. right? Wh- right? With your skill set mm. in growing businesses, in small businesses, medium businesses, mm. right? And, and you, you go back to your friend's question about making $28 million in, in whatever. Let's, let's, just, let's yeah. just take it down a notch, right? Just yeah. fair, right? And you're like, okay, here's, 200, here's your 200 grand. How can I make, what's the best vehicle for me to turn that 200 grand into three or 400 grand or 500 grand? When you're looking at your skill set and your in investments. Yeah. And so s- s- 
the, the old, the smart people might say, put it into your index fund, right? So index fund, in a year you'll have uh, whatever, 310 grand. You've got your same 300 grand and you pumped it into your businesses. Maybe you pumped it into ads, maybe you pumped it into a new sales process, maybe you started a new service line, whatever, whatever, whatever constraint you have in your business, let's just say you pumped it into solving that constraint in your business and your, and your business grew from $1 million a year to $2 million a year and now the multiple of that, instead of it being valued at 4 million, it's now valued at 8 million. Yeah. That's, that's what your friend was talking about, in my view. It's not like, so I definitely agree that index funds and passive investing, it's, it's the smartest thing. And Warren Buffett says it all day. I completely agree with him. But he's talking to people who don't know anything about money. And if, if you don't know anything about money, the smartest thing you can do, and you don't care about money, and, you, don't, and you, you know you should invest, pump all your money into an index fund all day long for your, for your, for your nine to five career. And at the end of it, you'll yeah. be fine. Yeah. But that's not the same. And also Warren doesn't do that, yeah. by the way. Um, which I find interesting, but um, I lost my train of thought. Different strokes for different folks. Yeah, yeah. So he asked me a previous question before the 36 to 20, in 24 months. Yeah. He said, how do you buy your time back? Mm, great book by Dan Martell, mm. Buy Back Your Time, if you haven't yeah. read it. Buy, how do you buy your time back is the ultimate question. Mm -hmm. How do you buy your time back as quickly as possible? Mm -hmm. And then he asked me that second question. The first question, is kind of your push-pull theory. Yes, put money aside into index funds mm -hmm. as you go, mm -hmm. but you have small opportunities or really big opportunities that you've got to keep an eye out on. Yep. Someone's got a card that they want to get rid of and they just don't care, mm -hmm. for example, and they want to give it to you for 2000 That's a small opportunity because you look on eBay or you look on car sales or whatever and you know that it's valued at twelve grand. you are like, ooh, yeah, I'll take it off your hands. No worries. Two grand, here you go, cheers, mm -hmm. flip it for 12, make 10 grand profit. Mm -hmm. Bang, that 10 grand goes into your business. Eight, eight of it goes into ads to boost more inbound leads, mm -hmm. which I love. Mm -hmm. Outbound leads, <laughs> that, you know? And that two grand can go into index funds. Mm -hmm. That's what he told me. Mm -hmm. Took me too long to figure that out. However, what I've been told by a lot of older mentors um, after him going, the shit that you know now, I wish I knew at your age. Mm. And now I'm saying the same thing to the kids. The shit that I know now, you should realise what I'm about to tell you. 96.3% of Australians who retire uh, after the age of, well, general age of 68 or whatever, four years after they retire, they have to cut back their living expenses. They mm -hmm. have to downgrade the lifestyle that they've worked their whole life to build. Mm -hmm. Most of those are the nine to fives. They have to downgrade their house. They run out of super. Some of them hopefully lucky enough to have paid off their house that they've worked their whole life to, you know, to debt of. And that's the problem. The other thing we can talk about is if we go to those 70 something year olds and talk about, talk to them, I guarantee you that most of them will have that regret and some other regrets like, not trying or not risking or not taking a jump at it. Mm -hmm. And I've done that myself. I should probably put that as content because that's motivating. That's the secret. But they're in a different time as well. I think most people, their biggest, well, my view is that most people's regrets will be the stuff they didn't do. Yeah. And it's, it won't be the stuff that they, they did. Mm. Um, I mean, you look back at all your mistakes you made in your businesses, and they're, it's, they're, they're, they're scars, they're war stories. It's great. They're almost good. They're almost good to talk about, you yeah. know? Um, like, if, if, if everything went smoothly from A to B, like, it'd just be pretty boring, to be honest. 100%. And, and no one, it wouldn't be worth doing. But, like, the stuff that you don't get to do, you say that money is the vehicle to open that whole world, mm -hmm. that's the financial freedom that I want. To be able to try most of those things. To be able to pick up a, the piano again. Mm -hmm. I, I learned, I, I was really good at it as a kid. Mm -hmm. And then for some reason, I just didn't keep going with it. I regret that. Mm -hmm. But to be able to buy my time back, to allocate myself an hour or two every day, pay the really good piano instructor in Perth, whatever they need for me to just learn it. So, so I, I was, um, like, I was like you, and I've, and I've done that, 
and it, it's like it, it's it, it, I now have the time to do all of that stuff if I want to mm -hmm. and what's changed for me is over the course of building the business I've realized and it's the piano thing as well I, I, I've been intrinsically motivated by business now mm. and I just want to do more business because mm. I love it it's like I learned to play the piano um, and stuff changes um, I, I'm used to be, you know, you're trying to, life isn't binary. It's not A or, it's not A or B. Life is like a continuum. It's there's just grays and stuff changes yeah. over time, all the time. And like when you're 60 and 70, you might not want to spend that much money. You might be happy just for your day to day, going for your walks, who knows? You might, you, you, you like, uh, from my understanding of the research, the older people get, the less money they spend anyway. Mm. Um, and so a lot of these conversations can be circular yeah. in that, you know, does Depends. it, and they, yeah. And so it's important to try and figure out what, what you want. Yeah. You, you, you have kids, two kids, two kids, how One old are you in, uh, in two weeks. So tell me about being able to, cause this is my biggest, biggest motivator mm. is to be able to be there 100% of the time. If I want to at any moment, pick you, up the kids, drop off the kids. You're not a, you're, you don't have kids yet? Not yet. Mm. I have, from, from a teacher's perspective, mm -hmm. observation, the kids that were mis, uh, misbehaved the most had parents who were alcoholics mm -hmm. or divorced or financial issues or all of the above. Mm -hmm. They weren't there for the kids is the moral of the story. Yep. Not me. Never me. Ever. I want to be there for my kids. Mm-hmm. Anytime. And I see that financials are a big burden where they have to take it in turns. They have to work as a team, which is fair enough. Mm -hmm. But I want to be there if I wanted to. So, so your, your success in getting your success in business and getting the, the finances to give you your time is the goal to allow you to do that. Yes. And so that, that, that is, again, quite binary. Right, and so if I don't do this, then I can't have that, which is I, w I would advise against that mm -hmm. um, because it mightn't happen, and you still need to be happy, and you can you yeah, can, of you course, can, you of can course, be happy. It's it's an like a, it's an aim that you know I'm not married to the idea. Yeah, I just would like to experience it. But stuff again, again, stuff changes. Like for me, yeah. I didn't want to have kids at, at that time. Mm. Um, and for different reasons, we, we had kids at that time because I was like, no, I want to do this. I, I want to do it. And it's, it's, they're just going to hold me back. And again, stuff changes. So I had the kids and it didn't do that. It like it, it drove me like on crazily. I, I was so much more motivated. Like this, this can't fail. This has to can I curse on here? Wait, yeah, right, this, 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 this has to fucking happen. Yeah. And then it just, so then all, all of a sudden, so then I was like, all right, let's just, let's just have more kids. This is great. For, <laughs> this is great. Right. For yeah. my motivation. And, um, you know, I love, love being a dad and the same, I wanted to be a, around a lot. I really didn't want a nine to fiver. Like, cause I, I, I don't like the idea of being away all day in, in saying that again, stuff changes is that I just, I, I, I view parenting now a little bit different than I did when I first, before I had kids. Uh, before I had kids, it was like, oh, I just need to be around all the time, which is important. That's definitely true. You want to be around in, in important moments. You want to be there in the morning. You want to like, be able to pick them up from school. Like m Moments when they, you want to be there when they're going to bed. Like Moments when they open up and they talk about stuff. Right? Mm. That, that's Im important moments in time. But they also learn by watching you. And, you know, if, you're, if they see you being successful in your own right and see your, your skill set and your beliefs and your values on how you operate in your day-to-day -day life, they, they, they learn by watching and they repeat. They, they're just these little, little mimics until they, they can kind of form their own decisions, yeah. right? But they just mimic and they'll grow up looking at you and be like, okay, he, he used to work his ass off. Right, and still made time for us. And then that, that, is, that I think is a, is a better dad than just being around all the time. So I agree, absolutely. Yeah. What I mean is being, having the choice to be choice. able to. Yeah. Not, not going, all right, yep. financially free, got kids, I'm there the whole time. Yep. I, yeah. I know I'll get bored. Yeah, 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 yeah. And kids <laughs> but, are hard, man. Sometimes yeah. you're just like, I do not want to hang yeah. out with you today. Yeah, so <laughs> no, matter, no matter what happens with my journey 
it's the opportunity to have it in the back pocket. Mm. That's what I want. Yeah. It's a checkpoint. Choice. That's yeah, again, we come choice. back to it. So money gives you choice. So you mentioned um, going, going forward into the um, – you mentioned you want to talk about consulting. Mm. Tell me about your consulting path. Yeah, so – before I started my business, um, I worked for uh, a consulting company, and um, I was like, "Oh, I'm, you know, I'm just trying to smash this particular thing, and I'm going to move up, and I'm going to become a, a director, or what, I, all, all of that sort of stuff." And so, I I remember that the. And I remember, like, they're like, okay, to do that, you kind of have to bring in business, mm. right? That's kind of, like, you know, all the partners and PwC and Deloitte and all. You know, you, you, can't be, you can't be an amazing, you can't be amazing at your job, bring in no clients and be a partner. The, the game is bringing in clients, yeah. bringing in revenue. That, ultimately, you can be pretty terrible at your job, bring in a load of clients and be a partner in one of those places. That's the game. The game is to bring in clients. So you're bringing in clients, you're bringing in revenue, people are happy. And so I was like, okay, you got to bring in clients. I was like, okay, right. So I, if I can win a few things and like I'm working in this company here now, if I can get some more work and like, okay. So did that, managed to have a bit of success in there, moved on to the management team. And um, in the meetings, I was expecting, you know, you know, how are we going to deliver a better service? Like how, how can we get a better outcome for our clients? You know, a bit more metrics and stuff um, ar around all of those things, more like more delivery orientated stuff. And uh, it wasn't. It was all about landing and expanding. We need to get a guy in here, and then we got to get more guys in there, more guys in there, more guys in there, get more day rates in there to grow the business. It's like a, a big glorified recruitment company. And uh, I was just like, what the hell? I was just, all of a sudden, I was like, oh my God, this is just, this is just. As I said, a glorified recruitment company. It's just uh, they, they were not talking about, they didn't want the best for the client at all. They wanted to get one guy in there on a day race and to expand, get more people in there as much as possible. And the, the idea of the day race, so my business is, is a retainer model, which in the construction industry is, is, is pretty, pr pretty different for the services that we provide. So yep. contract negotiation and contract administration. And so when you have a day rate, you're incentivized to be slow. The longer you take on the job, the more you're going to get paid. Otherwise, you punish yourself for being efficient. You punish yourself for being efficient, mm. where the retainer model is the opposite. You're, 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 you're have to be efficient to, yeah. to, to keep your retainer. To keep your retainer, <laughs> yeah. So you just explain the basic principles of every marketing agency out there. Yeah, as in like the, the day rate guys? Or yep. the, yeah, hire the day rate people. Mm. They, they barely have a marketing degree up their sleeve mm -hmm. and junior whatever mm. here's a client here are the kpis do it do it yeah this is the deadline mm. they finish the deadline oh cool here's another one yeah here's how many you can fit in yeah whether it's account management mm -hmm. whether it's social media yeah creation so we come back to it like is that value for me is that value I, I i love the idea of creating value for someone right so yeah if you if you engage us in our service or you engage me and i'm solving a problem for you i want to make sure that i solve that problem and some and some because that's right? how you can retain them yeah that's it and then so you, they're happy and the, the customer like you, you think about amazon and why they're so successful they're like obsessed with the customer the customers they're obsessed with um, complaints so they started off and they, they had a two, like in, we don't live in America, how cool it would be to, to well, talk about this in a second, but like, you know, they used to have a two week delivery. People complained. They had a one week delivery. People complained. Now, if it's not in, in America anyway, if it's not delivered the next day, people go wild. And the expectation, has, expectation. Yeah, yeah. they could be delivered the same day yeah. and the continuous improvement cycle. I love that stuff. But none of these companies are into that. No, they're, they're all just. Look, I'm sure there's some really good companies out there and a lot of really smart people in there, and of course there is, but the model itself is not in the best interest. Not in Australia anyway. Not in Australia. Well, that's exactly what I am figured out with the marketing industry. And that's your PwC and you're playing both sides. Yeah. You're playing the government and you're playing... <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> but I, with the marketing agency stuff, I realise the gap in the market is being able to consult the company who needs the marketing mm -hmm. but consulting them to teach them how to do it internally that's 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 fantastic that's really really good because marketing companies have a problem in in my view and i've really struggled with marketing companies for us and we do we, do, we don't do any paid advertising at all 
we do all outbound, probably for this for this reason, is that you can get ads and you can have someone just turn on ads and flood your website, right? But you need a marketing company to help you with your offer, help you with your landing page, because if people if the traffic is coming to your website, that's like it's the easy. That's the easy part. Right? It's so, the management and operations behind succeeding the next part. But the next part, yeah. So if your offer is bad and your your whatever is not converting, flooding of traffic is just putting you know, f flooding your system unnecessarily because people are not, aren't going to convert. Mm. Marketing companies really need to help people with their offers and go further down the sales sales cycle. pipeline. Yeah, and <laughs> that's ex exactly what I've learned the last year. When when I had that success in 2021, I was the top of the funnel, mm -hmm. and that's all I did. Mm -hmm. I c I couldn't stress to people enough. I don't do the sales. Mm -hmm. I get you attention. Mm -hmm. Is it the right attention? It's attention. Mm -hmm. You, what you want to do with that, that's up to you. Mm. Then they said, can you do account management? I was like, oh, yeah, cool. I would quote ridiculous amounts I'd never done before. Mm -hmm. Like, who the hell, how, did, how do you make 10 grand a month for the first time? What do you tell someone who's never done that before? Mm -hmm. I did that. But then I was like, I actually don't want to do this. Yep. 10 grand or not, I hate account management. But then I was like, what if I taught them how to do it? Mm. But then they didn't have time. Mm. What if you had the budget to have someone internal that had that you paid for to have the time? Because mm -hmm. if you don't have the time, you probably have some money. Yep. And if you don't have money, you probably have the time. Mm -hmm. That's really the push yep. and pull there. Sure. So then when they go, okay, cool, let's hire someone. The problem then was they would micromanage that person incorrectly. Mm -hmm. And that's when I would come in saying, don't do that mm -hmm. <laughs> because you're hindering their creative. Yep. And that's the gap that I found. Mm. Good. And then going back to the, the turning on the funnel of the ads and not being able to kind of hold it in because your operation's all over the place, mm -hmm. I've got retainers that have paused on me because they can't afford to bring in more people, mm. more clients. Yep. That's a good problem to it's have. Good problem, yep. But their operations are over, all over the place. Mm. So now I'm thinking to myself, do I get into operational management, like operations stuff? Do I get into BDM? Mm -hmm. I'm a, I was a math teacher at school. I love problem solving. Mm -hmm. Of course I want to get into it. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm, I'm happy with the marketing. I haven't moved on from that yet. I haven't yep. conquered that yet. But the, the gap that I'm seeing here is hire internally someone account as an account manager and then I will help them with the rest. Yep. Make sure they find the right creatives. Mm -hmm. Make sure they use the right tools mm -hmm. that I have you know, experience with because I'm a practitioner. Mm -hmm. And that's the point of difference that I have. Mm -hmm. But then I see other consultants, not yourself, but like other agencies and stuff. I look at their top of the line management. Where's your proof? Where's your, where's your anything except pay more money in ads and hey, look, we've got 1% click through rate. What about the organic? Mm. What about the sales? What's the, where's the tangible? They don't have any. Mm. In America they do because they have to. You have to, yeah. They have to here. Ah, you know, yeah, cool. We're killing it with word of mouth. Yeah, we'll let the agency keep ma taking our money. We, uh, we know it's burning. Mm. They don't realise it's burning though. Yeah. The agencies go, oh, look, a million views. Mm. It's a hard model to oh, the agency in my, in my view. But I love disruption. Mm. I disrupted the school industry. I disrupted the wedding industry. Marketing industry would be fun to disrupt. Oh, for sure. My bet is that within the next five years most companies will be looking for internal comp uh, marketing team. Oh, look, I mean, my, my general strategy for these things is find somebody who's really good at it or find a company that's really good at it and just do that. Yes. Exactly what you said. Show us how to do it ourselves. Show us what, like, not just you turned on this. That's what your mate that. did. Yep, that's it, exactly. Show us how to do it, and that, and that, that really works. Because then you learn as well. Yeah. I mean... I've got to ask you a question about mm. that. How far back do you think Australia is with the times compared to America? I th I, it, it, there's, there's, there is that, right? I don't, I don't think that far, because the internet is all over the world, <laughs> yeah. really. But there's, there's definitely a culture thing in that in Australia and the US, like... Sales in the U.S. is hard, right? Converting people in the U.S. is hard. They're so battle-hardened 
from cold callers. So battle hard from from sales calls. So they're just they're just like, and they're cutthroat. But then but then when they sign, they're like they're good to go. They're great clients, great clients. Mm. Australia is different. People people don't really like to be sold. Don't like any hard tactics in in selling. Where in America you have to use them because otherwise they'll walk all over you, right? It's, it's not like hard tactics. It's like you need to have it, your sales process dialed. Australia, you don't really need to have it dialed. You can have a you can have a friendly chit chat conversation. You want to buy this? All right, I'll buy it. Right, um, and that can happen. But then on the other side, people get, you know. They don't use the services as much. Um, they they kind of get distracted on on that side a little bit as well, and so for like biz ops, I think in America is a lot better. And so that when they can use a, a, an outsource company, and they're more inclined to use outsource companies because they can save themselves money, they will use it and they'll use it heavily. Yeah, they'll they'll actually yeah, and that I feel the same here. It's it's hard to retain someone that doesn't give you the time to succeed for them mm. and that's what i'm finding as well mm -hmm. and I, as much as i try everything to over deliver to go hey this and this and have you done this and i need this from you mm. to be able to do this next thing and mm -hmm. you don't hear from them from weeks yeah or you come up with something and they go oh actually nah yeah let's not do that and then you're like you've just spent two weeks i've just spent two weeks of this paid time you're paying me mm -hmm. and i get the sense of like because mm -hmm. I've got empathy, right? Yeah. I'm not a piece of shit. Mm -hmm. I feel like they didn't get their money's worth. Yeah. But is that on me? Depends. Yeah. It depends. does depend. It depends. But like, this is where reporting and meetings and all the, you know, like, this is the plan. Do you agree? Comes into play. Mm -hmm. And setting expectations as well. So if I come into your company and I help you with brand, marketing, and then making sure that it's an easy process for your sales team to then take over. Yeah. Do you have any objections with how I'm going to do it? Do you give me free creative reign with the content? Yes, no. Mm. Right? I feel like what we've had success with, so I can just talk from my experience, yeah. is in Australia, you really have to demonstrate success. Mm. So it's, it's – and that's like – when I'm talking about reporting, you're not just talking about numbers. It's like, okay, so like it's part of your sales process or part of your onboarding process. Like what, what, what is success for you guys in this? Yeah. And then, then you report to them, here's where we are on that thing that you said was a success. Yeah, you, 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 know, you don't allow them to hide. You, you make them set the goals mm -hmm. and then you just smash it. Yeah, pretty much. But you need to show them that I'm delivering on my goals. Yeah, and that's what I teach people as well when they say, Sev, how do I get a promotion? And I said, it's simple. How much do you, more do you want to make and do you think you deserve it right now? Mm -hmm. What are you expected f of you every week mm -hmm. of your daily tasks and job? Mm -hmm. And they'll be like this. I'm like, great. How much more than that are you doing to warrant that pay rise? And they're like, oh, no, I've just been working there for, for ages. So I should get a, a bigger pay rise. I was like, why? <laughs> yeah. I mean, loyalty, yeah, fair enough. You do get like that inflation rise and mm. a little bit of a pay rise every year. But other than that, you got to think of it from their perspective, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's capitalism. Mm -hmm. It is, yeah. <laughs> it is capitalism. It is. But it's like, and, I, and I, I empathize anyway, but at the same time, I'm like, who's taking all the risks? Mm -hmm. If the business folded tomorrow, that person has no business. You could just get another job, mm -hmm. right? And they're like, oh, okay. Some get it. Some will come up with some more bullshit. But then I'm like, okay, so you want to get a pay rise. Ask your boss, what is it that you need to do to get that? Mm -hmm. And if they say this, this, and this, you hit it. Once you hit it, okay, do I get a pay rise now? And if they say no, mm. are you in the right place? So I had, I had a tweet that went pretty, pretty good. Yeah. And uh, it was, so what happened was I had an interview. Mm. And, and and this guy comes on and he says, I've got 20 years of construction experience. We're looking for a contracts manager. Mm. Um, and f candidly, talked very highly of himself. And um, when I looked at his, his resume and after the interview, and I didn't say this in the interview, and I tweeted it anon anonymously, um, I was like, no, you don't have 20 years experience. You have one year of experience 20 times. 
And so if you think cool. about it, uh, I didn't say it to him, right? <laughs> I tweeted anonymously, which was, which was true because he could do that one year really well, I'm sure, right? But not additional stuff. So let's, let's just use an example of a, of a bricklayer, for example, right? You could, if you're a bricklayer in the, in the 90s and you work for 20 years being a bricklayer, right? you'll still earn the same money proportionally or, or very, you know, slightly more. Maybe you're a senior version of the bricklayer, but no more, right? Because you're being a bricklayer this whole time. That's, that's what most people do. Or as if you started off as a bricklayer and then you learned, okay, well, you know, I'm going to, I'll, I'll be the, I'll, I'll learn how to lead other bricklayers. Then, okay, well, now I, I've got a bit of a team. I might start a bricklaying business. Now I'm leading four or five bricklayers. Now, all of a sudden, that guy in 20 years' time is infinitely worth more than the bricklayer. Because he's got management skills. Exactly. Not just practical, you know, the, the, ba the foundational skills. Just continue of upgrading yeah. of your skills. And then, so your friend yeah. who's been working there for a long time, has been yeah. doing the same thing for the whole time. And from a business point of view, you're not worth more money to the business because you can't provide more value because you've been doing the same thing. In fact, I'm going to have to invest in you to train you to do this other thing. That you or or to get more value out of yeah. you, if I'm going to have to pay you more. That's why people need to move on. That's why people need more mentors, and then they're just the same mentor. They need that different perspective. True. And that's where I, because I, I used to do personal training. That was my first mm -hmm. business that I did, and I moved out of the gym because the overheads were ridiculous. Put it into my living room and made so much more money. Mm -hmm. And and as a full time uni student, so yeah. you know. Um, but then I was like, okay, what's next? I had someone use my living room during the weekends when I was not there as a studio. I was like, cool. So that means I should get like a commercial space for this because my neighbors are probably going to be like, are you, you know, what are you doing? Mm. But they were all chill because I've been there since I grew up there. But the next part of that was something I didn't, I couldn't get through the glass ceiling with. I didn't want to manage people mm. at that time. That's a different journey. I struggle with that too. Yeah. Mm. And then as a teacher, I remember one of the things I hated and my principal telling me when I, was, when I was a school teacher was everyone should be on a path to principalship. And I was straight away, I was like, I don't like that. And I still, I still don't like that. Maybe I'll, I'll change up my perspective. What, what did he mean? Like? like everyone should be aiming to become a principal eventually. Principal of a school? Yeah. Oh, right. I'm like, I don't want to do admin. I don't want to tell other teachers how to teach. Mm. I mean, I have some suggestions. <laughs> but I just want... I'm in there for the kids. Mm. And yeah, sure, if another teacher could be a better teacher and I can help them with that, great. Mm. If I want to be a team leader, head of learning in a specific subject, I don't want to be further away from the kids. I want to have a full day of just teaching the kids, mm. my kids. But then I realised there's a glass ceiling there. I don't want to become a deputy. I don't want to do any of that. That and also the other stuff. And that was one of the reasons I left teaching. Yeah. There's a funny, a funny concept. You should get a guy called Bill Withers on your podcast. Um, Let's get him on. He's, 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 I would suggest. Is he here? Yeah, he's in Perth. Yeah. Cool. He's got a company called Adapt by Design. Yeah. And um, he talks about specifically what you talked about there. And one of the problem in a lot of organizations is you might have a technician Right, so let's just let's just use technicians as a person who's who's got who's who's an expert in a role. So it could be a teacher, yeah. and so the technician. Typically, if the technician wants to move up in a company or get paid more, or progress his career, or become financially more secure, he has to go up in the business, which means he has to become a manager, then like ideally a leader. Uh, and move up through the organization to doing the stuff, doing the stuff exactly what you described that you didn't want to do. That was the only way to make more money. Mm. Mm. And so he talks about how can you create an organization that has a leadership team that allows people to remain in their technician role, but still be a leader of the company. It's a very interesting philosophy. And because it's, it's very good, like one of the, th the key things is from, from sales, for example, right? And I've learned this the hard way, like honestly, like twice over, right? And it cost me a lot of money. Salespeople, like a closer, is a different beast to a sales manager. 
completely different mindset, completely type of person. And so promoting a, 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 a closer or an account executive into a sales manager almost always goes to shit. And, but sometimes, and the closers often, I just want to be a closer. I want to make a shitload of money just closing deals I'm really good at. But how do I move up in the company? And so having a business that has an organization leadership team that runs the operations, and then you also have an owner's team, I think it would be great if you got Bill on to talk about that. Cause yeah. he's, he's, it's All a fantastic right. way to, um, to grow a business that is resilient and lasts the test of time. I'll get him on. I'll get him on. So I've got a, a couple more um, questions for you, like really quick ones. Shoot. Um, and thank you for the conversation. It's been enlightening and, and validating at, at times. <laughs> um, what's one book you recommend to everyone? Oh, what's one book I recommend? For, I, that's a hard question to answer because... I love books. Mm. Books have always solved problems for me. So uh, my first experience with, with books was in university and just like a big poker scene. It was like, I think it was a global, everyone got into poker. Yeah, like, I, love me, was, I love me some poker. And so people were coming over to our house and we're holding games and I was rubbish. Yeah. It was rubbish. I was like, I'm going to get a book and read up on this. So I got a book and I got, I got Doyle Brunson's um, poker book. I can't remember what exactly it was called. Got another book and I read it. And I started playing, I cleaned up. I was like, geez, these books things are great. <laughs> right? I, need, I need this book. I haven't cleaned up in a while. Right? Was and it uh, Daniel Negrano? Was it Phil Ivey? No, was it? it was that, that era. So yeah. Doyle Brunson is, is, the, is the main one. I think it's called Super System. Doyle Brunson, Super System. And there was another book about the guy who was super popular at the time. His name escapes yeah. me. Um, and uh, so I was like, oh, books. And then whenever I came across a problem that I needed solving in my life, I would read a book on it and then implement the book. And so w with business, everything. So marketing, read marketing books. Read all of, you know, uh, Brunson's books, different Brunson, right? Uh, Russell Brunson, read all of his books, marketing. Okay, sales, read, read sales books. Alex Hormozzi's books, offers and leads. And then, okay, scaling books. So ready, ready, fire, aim uh, and leadership. So then as you're going through this, now all of a sudden, like I'm in a leadership role and I'm, I'm shit at leadership. Okay, let's, let's read some leadership books, right? And so you learn leadership books and motivational books. So... That's a hard question to answer. I can't really answer it. I can tell you what I'm reading now. But um, um, I, th I think books are specific to solving a problem in your life at that moment in time is the best book for that's, you. That's a great answer. What's, what's the book you'd give a teenage boy to read? What's a book I'd give a teenage boy to read? Mm-hmm. <laughs> how That's to get through high school <laughs> yeah what's a book I'd give a teenage boy to read it's kind of uh, every teenage boy um, I I would say how to win friends and influence people yeah. I love that great answer yeah just great because answer. it's there's two like I don't wanna, I don't want to I don't want to lead him down the garden path of trying to start a business read all these business books he's not interested in mm. but how to win friends and influence will, it will help you in all aspects of life and in business Love that. Speaking of skills and trying to learn them and reading books about them, what's the one skill you're currently trying to learn? Writing. Writing. Excellent. Writing, yeah. Yeah, I've never been the best at writing. Yeah. Um, all right. And finally, if you could give one piece of advice to your younger self, what would it be? Um... One piece of advice to my younger self. Um, I don't know. Things turn out pretty good so far. Um, like, this, this, like I've, I've messed up so many times, made so many mistakes, got drunk so many times <laughs> when I shouldn't have been, and like done all of that sort of stuff. But I, I, I feel like at the other end, that was all. It all made me better today. And again, it's one of those things where it's, you kind of almost need to experience it to, um, to like, I often think if I had gotten into entrepreneurship in my 20s, that would have been cool. Yeah. I would have loved to have uh. done that. So that, it would probably be something I'd go, Kian, it took me a long time to realize that that was what I was good at. And that was who I was. Um, 
you know, do you know the way instantly, you know, hey, I'm pretty good at this thing, right? It seem, other people seem to struggle here and here, mm. and I find that pretty easy. Uh, it would have been nice to have found out, hey, that's, that's actually what you're good at, rather than trying the corporate game and trying to be great at that. And it was kind of pushing a rock up a hill, <laughs> you know, and I was trying to be someone I wasn't yeah. a lot of the time. That's a great answer. There is an extra question that sprouted from that. Sure. Um, and this goes more into your specific field. Mm -hmm. um, what's the biggest challenge you faced um, in quantum contract solutions? And how did you overcome it? Um, the challenges are always there. They're always coming. The um, biggest one that you're just like, oh, man. So at every, every there's all, it's like... Um, you know, computer games. Remember the Mario back in the day? Um, and you have the boss at the end of every level. Uh, I feel like that's kind of what business is like. You, you kind of have to conquer the boss every time, right? So, you know, the first time you hire someone, it's like, how scary is that, right? You hire someone and you kind of have to get over that. I think, but all, all of those things considered, the hardest boss for me to get over was um, becoming a leader. Um, and stopping a manager. That was hard. So I remember having a discussion with a, um, a, a mentor of mine, and I'm like, well, if I'm not doing this, I'm not doing this, like, what am I doing? And he's like, you don't understand leadership at all, do you? And I'm like, I guess not. Um, and th I think that was it. So, you know, I was very good at telling people what to do, and I wasn't very good at leading people. Love that. Love that. That's awesome. Now, um, there's a tradition on, on this podcast. Oh, right. The red phone. It's calling. It's calling. It's calling. You have to answer it. Mm -hmm. And the conversation is with someone that needs your leadership. They someone, don't know what to do. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to do. And they're worried they'll make a mistake and you're going to be on their case. What do you tell them? What's the problem? It could be anything. It could be anything. Okay. And so I'm going to talk them through. His name's here. Max. Max, Max yeah. Verstappen, yeah. winning too much. Um, all right, so, hmm, that's an interesting question. <laughs> so you don't know what to do. Okay. So my way, uh, am I talking to you or am I talking on the phone? Talk to the phone, okay. talk to Max. So Max, uh, all right, tell me what's going on. Okay, all right, okay. So what do you think are your biggest feelings around that? All right, so you're, you're scared. Why do you think you're scared? What are the things that are making you scared? Okay, you don't know what's going to happen. Why don't you know about what's going to happen? Because you, you haven't laid out your, your options. Okay. Do you think it would be helpful if you laid out all the different options in front of you? Yeah. Which of those options do you think is going to give you the best likelihood of going well? All right. Which of those options are you going to choose? All right. Go for it. That's awesome. That's it. Keon Brennan, everyone. <laughs> that was good. Thanks for joining me on the uh, show. Thanks for finding me on uh, YouTube Shorts. Yeah. Kid, do you remember which video? I can't remember which video. I can't remember which video. I was like, because uh, we, I've got a YouTube channel as well. And I was like, oh, this, this guy's from Perth. Because normally in my feed, there's no one from Perth. I was like, oh, is it from Perth? I should reach out to this guy and have a chat. And that's why you post shit on social media on every channel. Mm -hmm. Because someone will find you and you have conversations like this and it could sprout to something even bigger yeah appreciate you thank you for your time and uh hit, up, here, hit him up on uh or his his website and his linkedin uh, page you can stalk him on there will be in the description as for everybody else let me know what you thought about the conversation what spoke out to you and uh what you would have asked him uh in the conversation until next time good thanks